But today's uh, talk is called Deconstructing Coloniality Through Visual Arts. It's truly a pleasure to count with Kukuli Velarde's presence, a Peruvian-born artist based in Philadelphia for the last 20 years or so. Kukuli Velarde practice Kukli Velarde's practice spans ceramic sculpture, painting, performance, among other media. Her work, which revolves around the consequences of colonization in Latin American contemporary culture, is a visual investigation about aesthetics, cultural survival, and cultural legacies. Kukli was known until recently primarily for her ceramic work, often reinterpretations of pre-Columbian sculptures that allow for the contemporary commentary of issues. Um, but her work as a painter has gained visibility in the last few years. In 2018, she had her first solo show of paintings at Tallar Puerto Riqueño. And shortly after, the Pennsylvania Academy for Fine Arts acquired one of her paintings for its permanent collection. She has won major awards, such as a Pew and Guggenheim Fellowships, and continues creating and experimenting. Her upcoming performance and installation called A Mi Vida is scheduled for March of the next year at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kukuli Velarde. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure uh, to talk about myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> about my work, which is myself, because every artist is always um, using their inner voice and their experiences in their work. Um, I am a Peruvian artist. I've been uh, living in the territory of the Lenape or Linape for 23 years, what is known now as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And um, I, I have been an artist all my life. So I'm gonna show you um, a PowerPoint that I, I prepared about my work. And um, I, I understand that you will be asking perhaps questions at the end, but if there is anything that, um, is, it calls your attention uh, when I'm going through the slides. And if you want to ask, uh, I'm also open to that possibility if, if the professor is, is OK with it. So oh, first of all, I have to share my screen. <sighs> OK. All right. So the first thing that I do, and I don't know if that my only problem with this is, can, do you see us on the left, on the right side, or I always want to get, um, I'm sorry, uh, how do I, I, no, what I did, I'm sorry. <laughs> We we had you before. We saw the the um, or or pictures, but uh, above, you know, just small above. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what happened, and um, something has happened. Okay, I'll just begin like this. Um, I am from Peru. I usually uh, present uh, my country in a map so that people can find it. Sometimes they don't know it. It's okay. Um, I, I'm 58. Um, I came to the United States when I was uh, 25. I've been most of my time here in this country. And as they say, fish, fish doesn't know when it's uh, underwater, in water, until it's out of it. Um, and I think that every time that you leave your country and you look back, uh, you realize of a lot of things that in the what, what you were there uh, were not noticeable or you were used to it. But I'm gonna present to you first uh, the last work that I've been doing the last uh, 10 years or so. And the first one that I put is up is a painting from my series, uh, the Cadavers series, that is a, a self-portrait of me pregnant. And um, I, I, I like this painting and I, th I think that it's important <laughs> for me to put it in the first place because this is one attempt to escape the male gaze 
and to be able to see the beauty of my own body at 48 pregnant. And um, um, I made this painting while I was expecting my only daughter. And um, I actually finished the belly one week before uh, I gave birth. Um, I never wanted to have children. Uh, I was not interested about it until I turned probably 43, 44 that I thought, hmm, how would that work? And um, I had an in vitro uh, in Peru and I, and I got pregnant. I, I guess I was very lucky. Um, and um, I, I saw myself in the mirror and I thought, that I never, never found myself as beautiful as I did that day. And um, I, I began this painting and, 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 and I'm showing to you, it has uh, in the background uh, uh, motifs from the traditional, um, transitional, I'm sorry, transitional Inca colonial um, uh, textiles. And I'm supposed to be an either, uh, an uh, 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 old Eve. So as you can see, my, my, my life changed a lot since I uh, had my, my baby. And um, this uh, prompted me uh, the, to be a mother, prompted me to have uh, certain feelings that I never thought that were possible to love somebody uh, in the way that you love a child. And, since I'm an old mother, I was thinking, what is going to happen when she leaves, when she turns 18 and leaves the nest and, and leave my arms um, um, empty? And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to make uh, I'm going to make pieces with her face that I can hug when she's not there. I'm very dramatic. I know. So I, I made a little face of her when she was six. It was a, at that time that she was six. And, uh, and I made a mold out of that little sculpture of her face. And I began this series that I titled Ami Vida, exactly the same title of the painting that you just saw. And um, each of these uh, pieces are done not to be on a pedestal, but to be in my arms or your arms. As I was making uh, these, uh, these pieces, um, came this uh, terrible situation of, of uh, families being separated in the border. And, um, and I realized uh, that probably there was nothing, um, really nothing worse than taking a child away from her mother's arms. And uh, I, I couldn't believe that we were uh, capable of doing such a horrifying criminal thing. And, and this series that became, th that began as, a, as, as an expression of a personal sentiment uh, became to me a symbol of, of, um, of how, how um, te terrible is the idea of separating a child from her mother or her father. And that is what that the series stands for. So all the pieces are made to be held. And our, our, um, that's my daughter when she was uh, six. Uh, and our, our, um, our, our symbolic, our, our symbolizing um, all those children that should never be left without the arms of, of their parents. Um, this uh, series, Ami Vida, uh, to my Vida, is, her name is Vida, or to my life, if we uh, translate the whole thing, is going to be shown at the Clay Studio uh, in March of 2022. And we are going to have a performance in which the pieces are going to be given to the audience. So if you're nearby, come by, um, we are going to pass the pieces because ceramic uh, is, is delicate. Uh, artwork is allegedly valuable, has a price tag. But if, uh, if we are um, a society that is willing to separate the most valuable 
thing that a, a, a human can have, which is their progeny, you know, when they are kids, uh, they are very valuable. You can imagine that. Um, a ceramic piece is nothing in comparison. So I want to trust the audience to hold the baby and perhaps for a minute or five minutes to share the responsibility of her care. And I think that that is uh, something that all, all parents want. We want to be surrounded by a society that is willing to, pro is willing to protect your child. And that includes the parents in the border. So this is an ongoing series. I have so far 10, and I will be doing more as I age, um, because also my daughter is always in my work. And this is the last painting I just made. Um, it's, it's quite different uh, from, <laughs> from my ceramic work, perhaps. Uh, hi, Catherine. And um, this is, um, this painting is talking about uh, what it is to be an immigrant in the United States. I have been here 30 years. Um, 30 years? Yes, I'm 33 years, I think. Yes, 33 years. and. Um, I, I came here by choice. I, I could have gone anywhere. I just broke up with a, no, somebody broke up with me, a, 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 a boyfriend I had that I loved so much and he broke up with me. I was in Mexico. I wanted to leave Mexico because I couldn't be in the same country <laughs> than he was. And I came to the United States because my father has a, had a friend who offered me to stay with his family. And uh, I, I went to New York. And, um, but anyway, so I've been here for a long time. I'm an American citizen. Um, I know this culture. And uh, I wanted to do this painting um, because the, the feeling that I have been having the last few years is of uh, kind of unwelcoming. Uh, to be un unwelcome. I speak Spanish to my daughter, but uh, all of a sudden I have to, to, to look around who, I'm, who is nearby to speak Spanish to her. And this is a fear that, that, that you don't think or rationalize. It's just, you realize all of a sudden that all the, all the idea of, the, of America for all uh, is not exactly um, an idea that everybody has. So in this in this flag I in this flag in this uh, uh, painting I have the the American flag, and in it I uh, acknowledge uh, the presence of, uh, of of Native Americans in Pennsylvania. Um, you can see uh, the belt. Um, I'm right now I'm blanking out of um, the the exact nation who who made it, but who offered it to Penn uh, as, a, as accepting a treaty that, that as all the other treaties were betrayed, uh, was it betrayed uh, eventually. But this belt was a, um, um, a way of, the, of this nation, oh my God, how can I forget? I'm getting old, to offer uh, um, their word that they will follow the treaty. And the, the red strips have this uh, flower that has been here before anybody was here. It's a, it's a flower that, that is from this land. And all those ribbons that you see is me speaking Spanish and English and trying to make sense of that, of you know, the importance of, uh, of, of belonging to two worlds that you love equally and your right to be a part of those two worlds. And um, it has a lot of elements that I don't wanna bore you with it, but um, it has a religious element, superhero elements, uh, the Vitruvian man elements and uh, a lot of things, but ultimately is, is, a, is, is a presence uh, and, a, and asking for, for the right of being. 
Uh, this painting took me a year to make, and this is the other painting that that uh, Laura was talking, uh, and that is at uh, Pafa, and it's a painting which I am, you know, laying down with my 55 years old body, 56, no, I think 57. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, uh, no, 56. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, laying down on, on this, uh, textile that is, uh, inspired in transitional Inca, uh, weaving, uh, that was used for, uh, in, in, uh, women from the nobility, uh, who were, the first ones to accommodate to the new, not the women, but in general, the, the, the noble, the noble Incas, um, they, they accommodated to the new world, uh, you know, like this, uh, many of them, or they were killed. Um, but in these textiles, during the first 30, 40 years of, 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 uh, the, of the colony, um, the the tocapus and, and many elements that belong to the aesthetics of the Inca began to get mixed to biblical stories. So I I, I changed uh, some of those elements because I, for instance, don't use the tocapus um, in this painting just because I don't know what they mean and I want to be respectful with my own heritage. I change it to Spanish and English. Uh, on the top is talking about uh, um, being a woman in a patriarchal society. And at the bottom is talking about being a woman of color in a patriarchal uh, a Eurocentric society. And it's, it's titled Daddy Likey. And those paintings come from a, a series that I did in 2004 to 2010, I think. I stopped painting for a few years until recently. And the, the, the work uh, that you see are always uh, portraits of myself. Um, I'm very egotistic, I guess. It shows through, what can I do? It's part of my personality. And th this painting is to me very interesting uh, because um, I, I put this photo in Facebook and my husband's sister got like, she was upset and she wrote to me, how can you put my brother in such an attitude? And so, and, I, and her mother had to explain to her what the painting was because she got the explanation, you know, she, she's her mother anyways. Um, what happened is that this iconography that you are looking right now, I didn't make it, I didn't create it. It exists, it's a painting from the 1700s, is in, a, in the cluster of La Merced, in the, in, the Merced in, in the convent of La Merced, which is a very old convent in Cusco, Peru. And uh, you go to, to Cusco, very touristic, you can get to the, to the convent to go inside, you go to the cloister, you see the painting there, everybody's looking at it. And what is happening in the painting? The founder of the order is being breastfed by the Virgin. And um, it seems that at that time, uh, because people were not um, literate, and the, the best way that they find, found to indoctrinate was uh, through visual, visual things, through images. So in the way that they wanted the, the, you know, the, the people of, in the order wanted to convince everybody that he had a very special link with, uh, with the Virgin Mary was him having him breastfed by her which at this moment, it would be a scandal. Uh, in, you, if you think about it, there, there, that, that you, nobody is gonna make a new painting in a church, in a Catholic church with those elements. Things change. And, uh, but anyway, I put myself as the Virgin Mary. I put my daughter as the baby Jesus and I put my husband there. It's a family painting. And uh, I'm sorry if, if you see um, 
on the right, uh, all the images of us talking and, uh, and you cannot see the painting too well. This is Santa Chingada, the perfect little woman. Uh, women many times in this world of ours have to be um, silent in their suffering in order to be considered a good woman. So I thought, well, you know, if that is the case, we should have a pedestal for Santa Chingada or the fuck saint, the perfect little woman. And um, and there she has the br brill, I think is how you call it, the hor what the horses have in their faces, brittle, right? Um, that because she has to be directed and she has a chastity belt uh, because she only can have sex with the, the owner of the brittle. And she's pregnant, of course, uh, that's her beauty. <clears throat> and she has a very suffering heart. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And that's why she has all those nails in her heart. It's a very Catholic element. And um, and anyway, this is the, it's a, una, it's a, una esposa, madre, servant, slave, martyr, perfect woman. And on top of that, she has to use this mask in which she lightens her skin and looks happy so that, that, that she you know, accomplishes the, the paradigm of beauty that was exported to us and rendering all of us ugly people. Hi, Joseph. You missed the most important part of my talk. This is um, is uh, is uh, um, uh, my body, um, all bled. Um, it's called vigilandote, which means uh, you know I'm watching you, I'm watching you coming late to my talk. Um, I should have put everything on the left. Uh, this is uh, um, about uh, colonization and indoctrination, uh, the most uh, uh, powerful weapon uh, for, for taking over a territory was religion. And um, the, 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 the being behind me, headless, is an uh, archangel. The archangels uh, were very important part of the colonial aesthetics in the 17th, 18th uh, hundreds, and that uh, they had uh, their weapons, swords, um, and um, fusiles, and so on. I don't know the word in English. Uh, this is a, a saint, Santa Rosita, Peruvian saint. Um, very accurate, I would say, what I think about her. And uh, anyway, these are the, these are my paintings. Uh, this is um, a martyr. Uh, the title is uh, Love Me, Diosito, Love Me. And she's done doing everything, all the sufferings in the world so that she can be loved by God. And this is uh, me uh, having pity of myself. Why not? Uh, this is uh, Venusina, which is trying to, who has whitened her body and put a wig. She's trying to, she's trying to be um, part of 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 uh, our idea of what is beautiful. You know that that, that paradigm that never looks like uh, us people of color because it's not a personal call. And that was the first painting that I did of the series. I, I think I, I've been going backwards. I was young, 45 young. <laughs> and then I gained weight. Um, these are my old paintings. When I was a kid, I, I paint since I was 10. I had an exhibition every year. And um, my father put a lot of responsibility on me. I, I had to paint. And um, I think that was one of the reasons for which I left to Mexico. And then to, I, I didn't go back. 
But these are the paintings that made me who I am now. And even though uh, it was not a proper responsibility for a young person, uh, they, the positive thing is that it never allowed me to doubt about who I was. My father believed too much in me. He thought I was the best artist in the world. And he died with that idea. And here I am when I was trying to call his attention because my father from his generation, they never pay attention. They never paid attention to children. We were an accessory at home, not a part of the humans. <laughs> so I began painting since I was a kid. That's my father. He loved it. He began paying attention to me. And then because he wanted to be an artist, when he was uh, younger, uh, he felt that I could be what he never got to be. And I, I painted and I had exhibitions and um, I was kind of strange. And, and those drawings that I did uh, during that time still persist, are still part of my life. And I bring them back only temporarily in some of my exhibitions. I like to do these drawings that are um, without, I, I work without pencil, just directly with a marker and I began one figure and then I go inventing everything else. Like when you are a kid and you don't worry about how I'm gonna compose, there should be this, that or the other, it's just going and letting it go out. And then, um, um, you know, something that I never expected uh, appears. And then I painted white back again. Because it doesn't belong to nobody, not even to myself. And this is the last one I did at Taller Puerto Riqueño. I added my child now, she's everywhere, can't help it. She's even helping me drawing. And these are my parents when, when they loved each other. So I come from Peru. We are a mix of people. We are a mix of cultures. We have uh, um, different uh, patrimonies um, living alongside each other. And we have a lot of art, art done by people following uh, traditions are done by uh, people, urban people who go to art schools. Um, and all of it is my patrimony and I put all of them together. I don't think that there is, there should be a, 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 a hierarchical division of what is what and all of it is art. And it's part of what I've seen in my last, in my, I'm sorry, my first uh, uh, years uh, of life. And I think that what you see at the beginning of your life is what is gonna remain with you until the end. So these are the artists and the art, and this is the geography that I also have seen growing up. This is Sacsayhuaman, Machu Picchu in, in Cusco. I am from Cusco. This is Chan Chan in the north of Peru. In Peru, there were different... Peru is a creation. And before that creation, that uh, colonial slash Republican uh, creation, there were many nations all throughout. Some of them knew each other, some of them didn't. And, uh, and, and they were uh, very advanced in several uh, fields, some more in architecture, some more in medicine. And then the Spaniards came and brought their medieval minds and destroyed uh, a lot. That is Cusco, the, the main square of, of Cusco. And here on the left, you can see um, a very symbolic architectural um, the development. Uh, the first floor is an Inca um, a wall 
and uh, behind it and on top, you can see the, the, the Catholic construction is the, um, the convent of Santo Domingo. And uh, it's so telling of what colonization means. Yeah, the subjugation, the, the overpowering of one world by another. Uh, this is in Lima. And that is in Lima too, Republican uh, architecture and a wonderful man over there is my husband, the best, the best man. 22 years and I still think he's awesome. Um, this is a procession uh, we in Peru is very Catholic, uh, a procession from my mother's uh, balcony in my neighborhood where I grew up. Catholicism is very uh, imprinted. And these figures that you see are the Corpus Christi in Cusco, uh, 15 images that go around the square, uh, uh, following the, the, how you say that, um, the body of Christ. And, um, and these, these saints are, um, are uh, going around since 1572, not exactly these images. Uh, in 15, it began in 1572, ran for a few years, then they didn't happen for more years, and then uh, the, the tradition returned. And, um, well, religion is is uh, is imprinted as says everywhere, and it has shaped our aesthetics. As you can see in my paintings, I I'm very Catholic culturally, and and so you see Peru, it has so many uh, facets. And well, I came to to the states. I went to New York, and I almost got a. Uh, to work as an illustrator. And I was told to do uh, Conan the Barbarian, Marvel was interested or was DC. I, I, I was giving drawings to both of them, but it was such a long time. But anyway, I did this couple of paintings of Conan the Barbarian. I didn't know what I was gonna do. I didn't wanna paint, but they were telling me, you know, you can make a $2,000 per week if you do this. It was so boring. It was so tremendously boring that I, I said, no, you know, I don't care. I just cannot do this. And uh, it's, besides it's so terrible how they belittle women and how I didn't see it at that time. Um, I just was bored by it. I'm so glad I didn't continue doing this though. So, there I was in New York, and um, I went to, um, to, to Hunter College to do my bachelor's degree. I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to do painting, so I went to the ceramic department. The first semester, I hated it. The second semester, we were a year away from celebrating the 500th anniversary of Columbus landing in the Americas, and it seemed to me that it was such a criminal. <laughs> outrageous thing to, to think that there was something to celebrate. Uh, millions of people were killed. Uh, amazing, sophisticated cultures were decimated. Um, there was absolutely nothing that, that could be celebrated. And I was in the studio and I was working this piece. I didn't know exactly what to do. I saw nails and I began putting these nails on on its chest and all of a sudden I felt that what was in my head and in my heart had a way to be communicated through it, that I found a voice, a voice that I never had in the paintings I did when I was a kid. This made sense to me. And right there, and, uh, and right there I began my series with the colonized ones. I remember going to Central Park, carrying my, my cross. You have to be young to carry these things, heavy, delicate, not a good combination. 
but I was so eager to do something, to say something about uh, about this, that I I I would take the the cross, and I also would um, take these uh, baby like pieces. Uh, with me in the subway so that when people would ask me what do you have in your arms I would you know open it because I had it covered and then I would have the opportunity to talk about the celebration of the 500th anniversary and how how such a bad idea it was and so on and uh, and this is you know one of one of those babies uh, they are actually uh, no they actually represent children that were never born. And they were never born because the parents never had the opportunity to live. So it's all that life that would have existed if people were not exterminated. That's what they represent. And people still fight for the same rights at that time and now. So those are my my unborn babies, which are not fetuses, are just uh, children that could have existed if they were allowed. Santa Chingada, my first version, um, is a recurrent um, a character. This is still fitting. Uh, this is a series that I made of, um, uh, it's, it's titled Pure Love or Pure Lust. And these are uh, little cupids uh, with an erection, uh, life-size erection. And um, the idea behind was that, you know, this is in 1990, Nine, um, 99, um, the idea was that we women are always uh, kind of, uh, or we were always kind of uh, uh, preferred uh, innocent and, uh, and for whom sex, for instance, was not supposed to be part of our interests. So I wanted to question uh, that assumption uh, because innocence um, is not a good uh, a good thing for 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 women. Uh, even now, uh, you have to be alert and uh, about your surroundings. And um, it's still a predatory society. But at that time, this this the idea was just to to first of all to present how um, for us sex is an important part. And also, um, it was thinking about an experience I had in Mexico in the School of Fine Arts. There was this uh, guy from Costa Rica who thought he was God's gift to women, uh, who would always say something uh, allegedly to make us feel better. And uh, one day I saw him passing by, and I was you know, waiting for the, that boyfriend of mine who broke up with me and who was very, 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 very cute. And uh, I, I don't know why that is important, but it's important. I never felt like a good looking woman. So anyway, going back, what? And this guy was passing by and I was standing up there with all my confidence intact. And then I thought, well, you know, <sighs> he passed by and I, I say, papi, que ricas piernas tienes. And the guy looked at me like, like, like you threw a bomb on his, you know, uh, on his body. He, he completely felt he was uh, shocked. He was shocked. He didn't know what to do, how to walk. So it was strange and, uh, and kept going. So I realized that perhaps uh, um, it was my duty to, to make him um, know how much he was admired, right? And every time that I saw him, I just had to say something to him. And every time that I did that, for some reason that I don't understand, he didn't like it. So I, um, I, I, I kept doing it. Um, I didn't overdo it. I didn't see him that often, but every time I saw him, until he stopped me. He was like, no, you know, women shouldn't do that, and you know, that's not a. 
And it, it, it was so, so interesting to hear him say exactly all those things that we think all the time, right? When we are young women and, uh, and that are traumatizing on the long run, um, it, it, it was interesting to hear him saying that he who was basically a predatory young man. And coming back to this work, in all their, the hearts that you see and over the penises and around the legs, there are catcalls to men. And um, I, just, I just felt that I wanted to put that field a little even. They are very sweet. Um, I saw this piece, it's a 2000 year old Huastecan piece in a catalog of the Rockefeller Foundation uh, collection at the Metropolitan Museum. And uh, at that time I felt like it looked so much like me that I decided to, to redo it again, because if, if our artwork are self portraits uh, then maybe I existed 2,000 years a, a, ago and I made this piece and I remade it uh, 74 times. I, I made a mold, I made a piece, I made a mold and then I, I made different versions. I worked a surface uh, many, many times. Uh, some of them have uh, themes of, uh, you know, like, for example, if you see in the center, you see the Virgin Bride. She has the blood stain on her, on her skirt slash sheet because women had to be virgin when they got married uh, 100 years ago and, um, or depending where you are, uh, 50 years ago in Peru. And, um, and they had to show that they were innocent and virgin, and uh, and I I wanted to make a piece uh, of that. There I was young. Have I changed too much? Yes. And this is some of the pieces uh, that you can see. That, uh, that guy who dumped me, uh, he told me once that he wanted to die like a dog in the highway. So I made a piece uh, about him. And this piece, I was around 35 and I saw I was uh, uh, getting older. How little I knew. Another version of Santa Chingada. This is the last piece I made. Uh, it's a piece in which my father is like a cocoon that is peeling off me. I made this piece uh, when he died. And um, with him died a person who believed more than anybody else and myself, uh, or, you know, that believed in me. Uh, when he was at the hospital, uh, after uh, the surgery that ultimately didn't work out, um, when I went to see him, I opened the door and he was on a bed. There were four beds. All of them have just had heart surgery. And they were awake. And I go, I open the door and my father look at me and he says, and that is Kukuli. And I knew he has been talking about me since he woke up. That's how much it meant for him. He always wanted me to go back painting and I only got to paint one year before he died because I couldn't go back to painting just because he wanted. I had to want it too, but I, I'm glad that I did because he was so happy. And I made this painting of me sitting with my self three years old, writing a letter to him. It was also after his death. So 
So I'm going to show you something, and I'm going to try to be very brief, but I think that it's always important if we are talking about um, being an artist and having the, the freedom of doing whatever you want. I know you guys are not art majors, but this is something that comes from the, 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 the title is Water Toilets, and the subtitle is All of Us Deep Down, Same Shit. And what I did is um, I... Well, the idea was to, to gather uh, people's feces and, and uh, they dry them up like uh, taxidermists do, and then put them in this uh, a, a, a positive or the, would you say positive? Of, of the, water, the water container of a toilet, you know, the water that is underneath. And the idea was that no, no matter, you know, you cannot tell who who is it is. And I, I gathered 12, 12 uh, do, donations of people of different race, different class, different age, different sex, different everything. And uh, and it took me forever because I wanted to I wanted a taxidermist to to dry them up you know, in their machines. And I called all the taxidermists in the United States and none of them wanted to do it, except one that said that he could do it, but not in this moment, he was busy. I kept calling until one day he told me, ma'am, that's not art, it's crap. And I said, no, it's crap in art. Because, you know, I'm not gonna have a taxidermist telling me what art is or not. I'm not going around in this world telling taxidermists what is taxidermy. So I didn't take any, any offense. I dried them in whichever way I could and uh, I never presented that work, but I definitely had a lot of fun talking to people about it. And um, it, 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 it makes instant intimate conversations with the strangers. And uh, uh, it was great. It was one of the best experiences in art process that I have ever had. Anyway, um, I had a hiatus of a few years. Um, you don't have to be, you know, creating all the time. You're not a machine. And um, this idea came to me of, of uh, these ceramic uh, pre-Columbian pieces in the museums that I would see so nicely kept, so beautifully arranged in a showcase. And I thought, what would happen if they wake up? You know, what would they say about the people who are looking at them? Uh, what would they say about um, where they are, um, their function? is not being accomplished anymore. They have been exhumed, they have been transported, and they are being showcased. Um, and that is not why they came to be. You know, it's the same thing like with a mummy, or Egyptian mummy that you see in a museum. It's, it's such a sacri sacrilegious thing to, to have a, a human bodies in a, in a museum. Um, I don't think that, that those, uh, those kings uh, wanted to end <laughs> their their presence in the world, showcased as a exotic uh, museum souvenir, and so didn't these ceramic pieces uh, neither. And um, I began thinking about uh, what would they do. Some of them would make fun of the viewer, like she is. And um, some of them would be like, you know, oh, I don't care. I don't care if you are there looking at me or not. Uh, others would get very upset. Um, and, uh, and the title is very important part of these pieces. Um, the title has uh, slurs, uh, which are the, the slurs that we always hear in Latin America because we are very racist against, uh, against ourselves and others. So um, it, I, I, I did a research, uh, depending on which culture they were coming, they were Peruvian. I would use uh, words that I've used, and I've used that I, that I heard, and I use my face because if I was gonna use slurs in the titles, I didn't wanna use it onto others. 
I had to be on myself. And that's why they, they have uh, my face. On the right, you see the original face, the original piece that inspired the work. And on the left, you see my piece. And, uh, and, and then you see uh, the title. Um, it, part of the title is in, is, is in uh, Spanish because I, I, I don't think I have to translate. Uh, um, besides, it's very hard to translate. Um, as learn. Um, and it, it loses completely the, the, the reason to be there. So they, they, it, it was an interesting experience besides everything else to go and have the visual research that is part, such an important part of, of my work um, with pieces from different, different cultures, different nations. Kuli, it seems to me that it will be a good moment to go to questions if you feel like it. Sure. Guys, anybody wants to? And if, um, if anybody, um, we have two modes. We can put them in the chat or you can just, you know, talk to Kukuli directly. Any takers here? Any takers. <laughs> Any takers. Well, I think I called the questions. So I'm gonna start. Um, what are the, the, the changes that you have been incorporating in these pieces that you think you will not have thought of doing or crafting 10 years ago? Or, or, or you know, it's a, it's a recent, I don't understand the question. Something, something that you are doing now that you were not doing 10 years ago through your art or with your art production. I don't know how to answer that because I feel that, that my artwork is a process, right? And I, 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 if I were back to that time, I would be doing exactly what I'm, what I was doing at that moment. After that, the cycle of the series ends. It ends because there, that everything has been said, and uh, and and then I close that uh, that chapter. And then if there's another idea, I open that new chapter, which comes after that is corpus, which had a a, a different connotation. But in this series is is a um, is, talk, is talking about a, um, a plunderism, cultural plunderism that is legal, you know, because you can see it in museums, in galleries, in collections, and 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 that this association that is done between the the makers of of this work that are still here but are ignored. And, and, and the work that, that they did is showcased in a museum while the makers are perhaps uh, serving you the coffee in the deli next to the Metropolitan Museum or is cleaning up after hours at the museum, uh, you know, uh, completely disassociated. It's like, like, like this, uh, this, this culture of ours uh, has that facility to section and separate so that you don't think about this as being something that is alive, but something that is past. So while I'm working in this series, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about that, um, how, how this still belongs to the contemporary aesthetics is disassociated for those who can feel or, or, or understand, perhaps in closer terms than the erudito, no sé cómo se dice erudito, the, you know, the, 
the, the, the person who has studied it in their art history uh, uh, books and has a PhD on them. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we do have a question now. Um, and two questions. So the first one is, um, your work is so attentive to materials, but what you use and what you represent. Can you tell us about painting on bark? What traditions those paintings engage with or what it means to you, etc. I, I think Daddy Likey, it's painted on, on bark, right? Yeah. Okay, and the second question, so maybe you can combine them is, Roberto, has there been any specific challenges in the process of making one of your collections exhibition series? No, um, I don't do, I don't make reproductions. I, I don't uh, go and try to use the same clay or the same uh, fire uh, temperature or the same stains or the same, I, I, I don't, I don't try to replicate that somebody else's experience. I, I to me, um, that that it doesn't make sense. Um, I am not a, a pre-Columbian artist. Um, I'm I I live in a society in which you buy your clay. Uh, in this in this country of, of ours. Uh, 40 years ago, artists who worked with clay were uh, digging and they, they were buying the clay that was created or what, what was, this, was processed uh, from their own mountains here. You know, at 50, 60, 70 years ago, uh, it, there was more distinction about you live here and you have your clay there. That doesn't exist anymore. Now we buy clay that is made in whichever place. The places where they make clay are very polluting. It's completely a different thing than, than what it was. Well, it is still in Peru, for example. The people have the mountain there, have the mud there, they process, process it, they do the whole thing, they know how to do it, I don't. I belong to this culture. We all belong to this culture. And in this culture, whether you, you bring your bags of powder and put it in the machine and mix it with water and make your clay, or you buy that clay, you are still part of that reality in which there's no that kind of authenticity anymore. And I'm not gonna try to be romant to romanticize the, 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 the making of these pieces, trying to go and dig. It doesn't make sense because I am, a, I am as urban uh, 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 as you are, and I'm part of this society as much as you are, and this is our reality. It's a reality in which uh, we, are, we are losing those distinctions that make a special every territory. And I'm talking just of the United States. Okay, so when I make these pieces, I'm not looking for reproduction. I'm not, I, that is not uh, what is in my mind. These pieces are far much bigger than their originals. So the original is like this, and my pieces are life-size, the heads are life-size. So we are talking about uh, 22 inches to uh, 30 inches or whatever. And when you do a piece of that size, you cannot fire at the same temperature that they did. You cannot all you cannot do it because the piece is bigger. You cannot either get the sheen that the under that the slip or angle would give you, which is the, the color that you use to, to paint, if you were in low temperature. So it is not uh, in, in my interest to make a piece that is life-size head with low temperature and make it brittle. What I'm talking is about a reality that is my reality now. I am a, a, a urban, mixed raised, lower middle class Peruvian woman who have been in my country until I turned 23. And this is the heritage that I have seen in, in, that belongs to me and belongs to anybody who have, you know, a, who has been raised in, in, in an environment in which the, the, the 
the Inca uh, walls were uh, were there in in front of your house, and the and the and the ceramic pieces were in the museum where you you went very 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 often, and and they are part of your visual heritage. So I have no idea if I'm answering any of the questions, but I just wanted to bring here that they are not reproductions that I'm using American clay. I'm firing it with American standards. I'm just talking about my the, a reality from my mixed bread, urban middle class point of view. I'm not trying to be anybody else. I don't know if that's clear. <laughs> Melissa, will you mind reading the last one, since? Yeah. Sure, one second. Okay, so um, from Sydney Stewart, uh, we've talked a lot about the role of art socially and politically. Do you see your art as a form of activism or a way to actively spread awareness about certain things like the impact of colonization or the treatment of women, or is it more an outlet to express your own experience um, and thoughts? You know, it, it, it is interesting when we do that separation because uh, it, I was thinking a way there, there I, I know artists that do uh, an art, uh, th that make a body of work as a strategy, a rational strategy to, you know, to talk about something. And when, and then there are other artists who really, uh, um, in which I, I think I am, who, who don't see this as a political statement, but as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a reality, as a fact of life. I, it's the same separation that I would do between, you know, doing feminist work because you are a, fem, uh, you are a feminist and, or you consider yourself a feminist. I think we all are. And you need to make clear certain elements. And you being a, 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 a woman who just think that everybody is equal and nobody is gonna say that you know a guy has more rights or more brain or more anything than than you. And um, I I I respect any kind of work, but I think that that um, Art as a as a strategy, um, it 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 seems too rationalized. I think that you have to be convinced of what you are doing in order of it to have a voice. It just it's just not a matter of having a you know a a, a rational uh, decision. And uh, I I. I don't know. I I used to go dancing in in New York uh, salsa, and I would see some a guy who dances very well. I love dancing, you know, uh, close. And I would go and say, "Do you want to dance?" And then after dancing, I would say, "Thank you very much." And I would go back to where I was. It never occurred to me that I had to wait for somebody to tell me, you know to dance, especially when I see somebody who's dancing very well, I wanna dance with somebody who dances very well, I don't care how they look. And uh, and I, I never saw it was a, 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 a political or a feminist attitude, it's just, you know, I wanna dance and I'm gonna dance uh, with who I want to dance. So, you know, you make your pick, what is better, what is worse, I don't know. Oh, we have the last one. Uh, do you want me to go ahead and read it? I mean, if you don't mind, yeah. Sure, sure, no problem. Um, so from Samuel, uh, you said you moved from Peru at a young age and you have been based in Philadelphia for the past 20 years, yet your Peruvian roots are clearly a large inspiration for you. How do you maintain a strong connection with those roots, given that you are not only so far away, but also being in the United States, a culture that, like you mentioned, is very different? Are there any practices or meditations you do or nothing at all? You know, I ask myself the same question 
I came here and I speak with the same accent. I have the same accent that I had in when I came 30, 33 years ago. Um, I don't know what it is. I didn't grow up uh, knowing anything about uh, music in English, for example. And I, I remember where years ago, I thought I was doing a favor to my husband and I got um, a CD of uh, Led Zeppelin, who I probably have heard in the background, but I had no idea which songs were theirs or his, I don't know. And uh, and I bought this, this, this CD and I put it in the machine and he came to the house, he's from Kansas. And I, I said, I have a staircase to heaven and then I put it on and he went through it. <laughs> and I was like, isn't that great? And he was like, yeah, it, it, it probably was. But after you have heard two million times the same song, he kind of loses it. And I realized, you know, he grew up with it. I have fresh ears. <laughs> I, I, I have. I, I can understand perfectly American humor. Um, I, but the music uh, has not has not permeated for some reason or another. And uh, I like music in Spanish, for example. And my parents were very Peruvianists, and my mother uh, took me everywhere in Peru. And, um, and and they always, uh, my parents were journalists. And when they went from Cusco to Lima, uh, they, they found a, a city that was completely uh, uh, unwilling to, to learn about what was happening beyond its little borders. And um, it was part of their duty, they felt, to write about that amazing, territory that uh, Limanians uh, don't care, uh, didn't care to learn about and even now, but that time was worse. So I, li I lived in a, in a house where my parent, my father would have uh, parties with, with Cuscanian music, with Cuscanian actual uh, players of guitar and they would get drunk and sing. And I know all those winos, all those songs. And, and I've been in Cusco with my mother going to small towns and visiting and looking and learning and, and, and enjoying it. And I, I ate in my house food that you will never know about that I miss in this very moment. That every time that I go, I have my lawa de maíz, I had my carapulcra. And, and all those are cultural elements that survive with you as you survive. And, and maybe that is, you know, that, that is the thing that my, 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 my coming here was too late to become. And to become. I think this is gonna be the last one for today. Uh, Xavier uh, says, have you noticed the change or increase in how people appreciate your artwork? in the wake of current social political movements? And if yes, why? Well, I've, I've always been lucky with, with my, my work, and though I don't know how it would have been if there were not uh, a, a systemic uh, racist uh, society. But um, what I have noticed is for the first time, and look that I come from the 90s. The 90s, there was this attempt of multiculturalism that didn't come actually to complete fusion, fusion, I'm mispronouncing it, but you know what I mean. Uh, it was a trend, right? This time, I what I see is in the universities, they are beginning to talk about decolonization. You know, there are more people who know what means the word to decolonizing and it's kind of cute, um, and, and I think that it's important. And I think that, that uh, I hope that it doesn't end as a trend. I, I see that some art departments are making an effort to have professors who are bringing, not, 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 it's not a matter of professor of color, a professor who can bring uh, uh, information that is lacking because, you know, it's lacking here because it's, a, it's, a, it's an information of a different reality that the students can learn from. And, and have a better open, you know, much more, more open vision of what is the world that is surrounding them. So I see academically speaking, I, I, I see that they are interested. They are inviting me to teach. I'm teaching at Tyler University. I'm gonna teach at MICA. I, 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 I hope that 
I don't think that this is as before a kind of tokenism. I think that it's now more, uh, oops, we really have not been our, our homework here and they are trying to, you know, to, to give better education to their students. Awesome. On that note, we're going to end on time. Thank you all for being here. I think the, the talk was amazing. Kukuli, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, virtual clubs too. Accepted.